everybody, this is Salix with another video. I got my coffee here, partially because it's cold as fuck, and also because this is gonna be a long video. We're departing on a journey today, my friends. A journey from A to Z through my entire CD collection. Jewel cases, digipacks, box sets, it's all getting covered. Depending on how long this individual video runs, this will either be A and B or A, B, and C. That really um, will depend on where it lands as I get to the editing stage. Let's get into it. We're starting out on a pretty brutal note with Abominable Putridity. This is the Anomalies of Artificial Origin. This is a digipack. Now, normally I try to steer clear of digipacks, but sometimes, as in this case, it's the only or best version that an album has out on the market. This is a slam slash brutal death metal piece. And my favorite from this particular band, this is a Russian group. And I have one other release by them, which I'll get to in a second. Now, as you can see, no exception to the unspoken rule of brutal death, what with the intricate and vibrant cover art. It reminds me a lot of a dysmorphectomy release with a kind of blue purple color scene going there. It's uh, really fucking cool, and as if that wasn't enough, the music is nice too. Next up, we have the other Abominable Putridity album I have. This is In the End of Human Existence. This is a reissue from 2009. I forget when the original came out. I want to say like 2007 or something. In any case, um, definitely the weaker of the two, but still really good. Uh, kind of standard brutal death metal fare here. Shaking things up a bit, we have this. This is Absu, Mythical Occult Metal. This is a double disc digipack of cut tracks, covers, demos, uh, general tidbits from throughout their career up until this point. Looks like it's uh, 1991 through 2001. This is my introduction to Absu as a whole, and I really like it. It took me a while to come around to what they do. Their style is very much kind of like a uh, blackened thrash sort of sound and their singer, Proscriptor, who, from what I understand, is also the driving creative force behind the group. He has a very interesting vocal delivery. He does mainly harsh or semi-harsh vocals, and yeah, they're just unique. I don't really have any other word to describe them, and it was one of the biggest parts of their sound that took me a while to cross over into liking. Um, Especially on this first song, The Gold Torques of Uleid, or Uleid, I don't know. Um, the way he delivers the verses is interesting, but also kind of weird, especially to ears that are less initiated into more extreme or um, just weird sounding extreme metal. It took me a while, but I'm really glad that I kind of clicked with it because this is, uh, I really like the approach that they have to their sound. Unfortunately, I don't have any other Absu, but I hope to change that in the near future. Bringing things back to Brutal Death Metal, we have Abysmal Dawn leveling the Plane of Existence from 2011. This is one that I picked up a long time ago and haven't really listened to in quite a while either. Again, um, the Brutal Death Metal album art rule goes unbroken. Um, good standard uh, death metal, really. Following that, we have something a little bit more classic in the general metal consensus. This is Accept. We have Metal Heart and Balls to the Wall. Now, this is an original, I'm pretty sure, from 85. And this is a reissue with some live bonus tracks that, I mean, live bonus tracks to me always feel a little low effort. You just tack on uh, tracks that you have lying around the studio anyways, or that are pretty easy to uh, just tape while on tour and then just slap those on and, you know, re-release an album. It's whatever. Um, I mean, Accept isn't even a band that I really like that much, hence why I only have two releases of the, theirs in my collection. Um, these are relics of a time when I was kind of just getting a feel for metal and what I liked within the overall sound and scene. So I was kind of just buying or picking up anything that I knew was generally well regarded and Accept happened to be one of those bands back in the early days. I mean, you still can't beat Balls to the Wall as a song. It's pretty much, it's very anthemic, very good. I like London Leather Boys too off this one. And then Dogs on Leads is the only song that really catches my attention here. Um, in recent years, I've come to really um, fall out of love with Accept and not really stick around for any of their releases before or after really. I've heard Fast as a Shark and all that, but 
didn't really do much for me. This next bend happens to do a little bit more for me. This is ACDC. Uh, this is a huge, huge band for me breaking into rock and metal, as I'm sure it was for a lot of people. Uh, I can tolerate or outright enjoy most of what they've put out throughout their career as, um, you know, repetitive as it may get. Starting things out on kind of a lower note for ACDC standards, this is Black Ice, originally released in 2008. There's only about two or three tracks I like on here. Rock and Roll Train, War Machine, and Wheels are the real standouts here, but um, modern ACDC um, is not really much of a powerhouse in comparison to the 70s albums and even some of the 80s stuff they put out. Speaking of that, we have 74 Jailbreak. This is the uh, jewel case version. I actually, I have it in Digipack too for some reason. Um, this one is an EP uh, released, obviously, 1974 originally. I like Jailbreak on here. Uh, title tracks for ACDC are generally really fucking good. And I like the cover of a blues artist that I should probably know called Baby Please Don't Go. That song is really good. And um, I mean, they lost a lot when Bon Scott died, I feel. All of my favorite albums from them are from his era of the band, of which this belongs. This is Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. This is an uh, album pretty much everybody knows at this point, so I don't have to belabor the record and talk about it too long. I will say that I do admire the fact that even the ballad on this one is a song they managed to make engaging. I really do uh, like that one. It's one of the stronger ones on the album for me. Um, Digipack version of uh, Jailbreak. Now, as I said, I generally try to steer clear of Digipacks unless they're very cheap. And even then, uh, if I do find the jewel case version, I like to try to um, swap it out in my collection and resell or give away the Digipack. Evidently, that did not happen with Jailbreak, but maybe one day. Highway to Hell. Oh, God. No. It's high voltage. Highway to Hell is next. Um, in any case, this is their debut, as you know. Every good song on this record is stupid overplayed. Um, not my favorite ACDC album. As I promised, this is Highway to Hell. Another album that I don't really have to talk about too much. This is probably my second favorite. Let There Be Rock follows this. My biggest complaint about this album is that the songs don't need to be as long as they are. They're, um, they would hit a lot harder and just be better songs if they weren't freaking um, like over five minutes long. No ACDC song needs to be over five minutes long, in my opinion. Here's ACDC Live. It's pretty much what it sounds like on all fronts. Don't need to talk about that one. This is uh, somewhat of a comeback album in the 90s. Um, Thunderstruck, everybody knows. I like Fire Your Guns on here and Are You Ready? And outside of that, oh, and Money Talks too. But yeah, not a not a great album so far as the ACDC catalog goes. This is Rock or Bust that follows that. Um, not, you know, temporally, obviously, but uh, this is something I got for Christmas and to be honest, th that's the only way that this could ever become part of my collection because I just do not care for this album um, and never would have picked it up if I hadn't gotten it as a gift. Outside of the title track, which is like eh at best, this doesn't have much. Here's my favorite though. This is Powerage, 1978, I believe, was the original release of this one. Um, Every song here is 110%, and I don't know why it's slept on as much as it is. For my money, this is the best um, that Bon or the guitarists had to offer for this band back in their true heyday in the 70s. Next we have this. This is For Those About to Rock, and then the subtitle being We Salute You. Outside of the title track, I don't see this one getting a lot of love, and even then, uh, not really a high-ranking title track when the entire ACDC discography is concerned. However, this record does have a lot of nostalgic value for me. Uh, this was one that really helped open the floodgates for me back in like ninth grade to rock and metal. I remember walking around school playing like Evil Walks, Call of the Devil, uh, Night of the Long Knives, that sort of stuff. And uh, to me, this, this probably ranks higher than 
a lot of other people's ACDC rankings might put it. And that's it for my ACDC collection. Let's move on to... No, we have one more hard rock group to get to, and then we're gonna delve into the real, like, bulk of the metal section that my collection has. Sticking with the same era of both uh, music history, uh, genres, and my, like, uh, my evolution, so to speak, as a rock and metal enthusiast, is uh, Aerosmith. So we have this, this is their debut. Not a great album to my ears, a fine debut, but pretty much everything they put out in the 70s after it um, outshined it. That is followed up by, not again temporally, this is South of Sanity. This is the double disc live album and another one which I would never really get today. Luckily it was pretty cheap, but Live albums, with very few exceptions, um, seem to be very phoned-in albums for me. There are not many where the quality of the recordings and the energy of the performance justify shelling out more money for songs that I pretty much already have, for the most part, in their studio uh, recorded form. Uh, we'll get to a few of those exceptions later down the line, but... Let's move on to some of their studio material that is far, far better. Speaking of which, we have this. This is Get Your Wings, originally put out in 1974. This one is a big record for me because back when I was first picking up guitar, this was the record to learn from. Same old song and dance is one of my favorite, it has one of my favorite like just rock riffs in general. It's catchy as hell and the rest of the album is good too. Uh, Woman of the World, Lord of the Thighs, Pandora's Box, Train Kept Rolling. It's uh, a high-ranking album in terms of the 70s Aerosmith material. Um, this one, however, happens to be ahead of it in my um, ranking. This is Toys in the Attic, 1975 or 6? Yeah, 5. Um, the only song on this record that I would cut is round and round it's it overstays its welcome very repetitive not really one that i look forward to on this record but pretty much everything else is good everybody knows walk this way and sweet emotion but i find the toys in the attic title track to be a classic as well as uncle salty uh even the joke song big 10 inch record is uh pretty good in its own right one record that I misplaced for a second there is this one. This is the last of the 70s Aerosmith that I care to have. This is Rocks. Um, this is another stellar record. Uh, the energy here is great, and outside of Get the Let Out, I find every track to be pretty damn enjoyable. From here on out, it's gonna be mainly metal, so hold on to your butts. The first band that eases us into this segment of my collection is this band alchemist now i have tried to record this particular cd video uh like five times now and for various reasons it hasn't worked out so at this point the cds are kind of out of order um so you know whatever the first album i have to show from alchemist is this one this is my favorite this is organism originally put out in 2000 now this is the record that turned my attention to alchemist and the band itself is I would classify them as a progressive metal band, and they hail from Australia. Not sure what city, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, point being that they incorporate a lot of different elements into their sound. They have some harsh vocals, they have some clean vocals, they have, um, in this record particularly, they have a lot of traditional, um, like, aborigine Australian instruments, uh, and drums, and didgeridoos, and all that sort of shit whistles and stuff um which makes this album a really interesting listen like i said it's what uh brought my attention to the band and i actually found them from a youtube video that was like some like folk metal world tour where they would play you different uh snippets of songs from different bands around the world with their own uh, signature approaches to the general folk metal formula and i found alchemist's feature on that video to be incredibly engaging for, I mean, outside of just the folk metal elements, the vocals. Like I said, they incorporate harsh 
and clean, but the harshes are spectacular. Um, the general, uh, if I were to compare them, like sound-wise, to a different band or a different singer, uh, Peter Tatgren from um, Hypocrisy comes to mind. The high pitch shrieks that the singer for this band does are very reminiscent of like uh, Abducted and Roswell 47 and just a lot of the higher pitch stuff that Peter's done with Hypocrisy and I had already been a huge fan of that band so this really clicked in no time. I have two other records from them. This is Embryonics, uh, two disc sort of, uh, I'm not sure if it's a compilation but it's uh yeah, it looks like it's demos, uh, unreleased recordings, some live stuff. A good supplementary piece to have to the Alchemist studio record um, collection. This is the last one that I have from them. This is Austral Alien. Now, if I remember correctly, they kind of have less of a folk edge on this album. It's more straight up um, progressive metal. And it's just, it's good in its own way. I have to say, I do prefer the Organism record over this one, but stuff like Solar Burn, Alpha, Capella, Nova, Vega, uh, First Contact, and uh, Speed of Life are all really good tracks. And it's got some like trippy art too, it's pretty cool. Getting a little lower brow here, we have Ailstorm. I have two records from them, and this is a band that, I mean, I've seen them live. I've kind of fallen out of love with them, helped in no small part by the fact that they've completely um, folded. They were always kind of a humorous group, and that can work. Stuff like Municipal Waste can have some fun songs or just, you know, there can, I'm not against fun in music, but I do have an issue when fun is an excuse to write lazy music or um, put more effort into your lyrics and the tongue-in-cheek shit than the actual riffs, which is what I'm here for. Um, so yeah, I don't think I would ever shell out more money for an Ailstorm release, but these aren't, you know, bad for what they are. It's just fun party metal. Uh, of the two, I definitely like Sunset on the Golden Age better. Following Ailstorm, we have a band that was, at least in their early days, a lot higher caliber in terms of their riffs and overall metallicness. This is uh, the preeminent Viking metal band, Amonomari. Now, uh, I'm not a fan of the idea of Viking metal. I think it's a pseudo genre and um, only only thrives because uh, it is good for clickbait and shit. Um, this is melodic death metal with Viking lyrics, and I'll probably go on some autistic rant about Viking metal and the differences between different subgenres in some other video, but I'll spare you guys that headache for now and speak specifically to the music here. This is uh, with Odin on our side. Now, alphabetically, I'm pretty sure we're gonna, eh, never mind. I was gonna say we're gonna be going like in reverse order, but it's all jumbled at this point. It's all on mind. Um, so this is, as I said, with Odin on their side, but it's also, I think it's a fair judgment to say that this is where the band really peaked. Um, it's definitely one of my favorites, either first or second favorite of Monomarth release. And it blends two approaches that the band has had over their career predominantly, namely um, super well, produ well, production? Uh, well produced super well produced uh, slick mellow death with um, very kind of anthemic uh, easy to follow melodies and then their early stuff in the 90s and early 2000s which was a little more rough around the edges mainly in part because their budget probably wasn't that great um, this manages to marry the two approaches perfectly and as consequence is like their best work um, Valhalla Waits Me, Runes to My Memory, uh, Hermod's Ride to Hell, Gods of War Arise. I mean, it's there are no bad songs on this record. The same can't be said for this. This is uh, Deceiver of the Gods, 2013. It has a cool album cover, like an album art, I'll give it that. And actually, this digipack, uh, I won't, you know, 
yeah. fold it out, but the art is like expandable or whatever. The songs here sadly don't all live up to that, um, the level of the last release that I covered. I like the title track, uh, As Loke Falls, Father of the Wolf, Shapeshifter, and then Under Siege is kind of boring. I like Blood Eagle, uh, We Shall Destroy, and Hell are pretty abysmal. Uh, as is coming at the tide, this is, um, I would probably give this a 60% max. This record here, Twilight of the Thunder God, is, for one, one of their best known releases as well as I think one of their stronger ones and marks the end or beginning, however you want to dice it, of like the good era of Amon Amarth where their albums, for me, were enjoyable start to finish. Uh, it's hard, again, to pick a bad track here. There are two that are a little bit um, less engaging than the rest, but it's kind of unfair competition when the title track hits as hard as it does, as well as Free Will Sacrifice, Where Is Your God, Faryags and Miklagard. The two tracks that are kind of duds here would be The Hero and Embrace of the Endless Ocean. For me, those never really caught my attention as much. Some cool little piece of trivia on here is they actually brought in Rupe Latvala from, um, I think he was in Children of Bodom at the time, to do the guitar solo for Twilight of the Thunder God. And that was really the crowning piece on that song that makes it one of the best that Amon Amarth has ever put out. Taking things way back, this is their debut. This is Once Sent from the Golden Hall. Now, this is the rawest that Amon Amarth ever was, uh, excluding, of course, like demos and stuff. But in terms of the studio albums, this is the roughest they got. I like Dragons Fly Across the Waves and Victorious March. I haven't listened to this one in a while, so the fact that there is no um, track listing on the back doesn't make it any easier to recall which songs really caught my attention. Oops. Okay, we got The Avenger next. This is 1999. Um, I believe this is an original. Produced by Amon Amarth. Production is better here, but still not as great as their modern stuff, for better or worse. Bleed for Ancient Gods, The Last of Pagan Blood, North Sea Storm. This is a solid album um, from kind of smack dab in the middle of a, the good Amon Amarth era. Another one that's pretty damn nice. This is uh, Versus the World. This is a reissue, again, with a kind of low effort live disc shoehorned on there at the end which is basically a uh, replay of the album, the studio material played live, which I really didn't need, but whatever. Uh, good album, Death and Fire happens to be one of the best Amon Amarth tracks ever recorded. Uh, the tapping riff, if you've heard the song, you know what I'm talking about, where the guitars do the cool little tapping thing and the double bass hits under that. For the stab wounds in our backs, where silent gods stand guard. Um, I mean, this is a solid Amon Amarth record. Searcher Rising follows that one. Again, uh, this is where the cracks were really beginning to show. Uh, cracks that were compounded on the next album, Deceiver of the Gods, that I already covered. This originally came out in 2011. Um, but again, uh, bonus DVD on the reissue here that uh, is what it is. We got War of the Gods, uh, Tox Taunt, Loke's Treachery Part 2. That's a continuation of the song, a song that was on uh, with Odin on our side. Slaves of Fear, Live Without Regrets. You know, this is a fine album, but starting to go downhill. Then we have The Crusher. This is a pretty cool album from, uh, oh, 2001-ish, maybe earlier, because I think this might be a reissue. It has a uh, possessed cover, The Eyes of Horror, as the bonus track. Uh, this one's a fun one. I don't find myself coming back to it as much as some of their other albums, but it's not a bad album at all. Here's the latest Amon Amarth album that I got, uh, probably right around when it came out. This is 2016's uh, Yom's Viking. This is uh, an incarnation or a good representation of what Amon Amarth is up to now. Uh, they're very much a case in point of a band either... Uh, out of label um, compilation or uh, 
label pressure is probably a better way to say that. Either out of that or exhaustion of their ideas, they kind of move towards a more accessible, like clickbaity thing, um, really trying to capitalize ever more on the Viking theme, which, you know, is what it is. This album's all right. I don't mean to go on some tirade of uh, what I think of the band, but you know, this album's fine. Younger Me was blown away by that. And uh, that's about it for the Amon Amarth. Another band uh, from a neighboring country is uh, Amorphous. Not really in the same realm for the most part as Amon Amarth. They are semi, they're pretty melodic in their own right. You have uh, Tales of a Thousand Lakes and the Black Winter Day uh, EP stapled together for this reissue. This is not my first exposure to Amorphous, but it's one that I have found love for in recent years. Um, Death Doom, which is kind of what this is going for, was not really my cup of tea. I didn't really get it when I first started out down the road of, you know, extreme metal. But <clears throat> like I said, this has become a really good album. For me and living up to the hype it gets and then some it even has a doors cover as uh part of the track listing on this which is really cool uh black winter day has an absolutely fantastic melody that it rides on for the entire song um and the other tracks here are really good too here's where my journey with amorphous begins this is their 2018 album queen of time this is a very interesting album, and I mean, Amorphous is a band that, true to their name, has not really stuck with one subgenre their entire uh, career. This one is, it's hard for me to pin down where this one lands. There are some harsh vocals, but I don't believe, like, there's not enough for it to be a purely, oops, um, freaking, it's not a purely melodic death record. It's just kind of melodic metal as unhelpful as that moniker is. Now we have Karelian, the Karelian Isthmus. Um, this is, I believe, either their first or second full length. I can't recall. It's good. Um, it's less melodic than uh, Tales of a Thousand Lakes. A lot more of that Fin Death, Fin Death Doom sort of sound here. And it's really good for what it is, uh, somewhat raw production there as well. Jumping ahead in time, we have 2013's Circle. This is a pretty squarely melodic death metal record, very uh, bombastic and uh, kind of middle of the road for me personally in terms of the amorphous that I've heard and that I have. I like Nightbird Song, that is a really good track, but outside of that, um, Hopeless Days is fine and Narrow Path um, this is one, again, that I don't find myself returning to that often. Moving on to another band that I really, really love, and probably one of the most extreme bands that I listen to on a regular basis. We have Anul Nathrak, or Anul Nathrak, however you pronounce it. First album that I have to show off here is The Whole of the Law. This is their 2016 uh, offering, and one of their best. Um, I hold this up to be one of their best. And honestly, I believe the consensus is uh, much the same. Not my favorite, but very high up there. And definitely the album that I would recommend to start with if you haven't heard this band, either this or In Darkenment, which I'll show off later. We have the this one, this is 2007's Hell is Empty and All the Devils Are Here. This is a... Uh, very interesting. It's not industrial by any means, but it does have a very kind of robotic, chunky feeling to it on a lot of these songs. Um, this one falls a little lower on my personal ranking. Uh, I like Virus Bomb, uh, Until the World Stops Turning, and Screaming of the Unborn. Those three tracks are the highlights on this record. But it is outshone, or outshined, however you want to say it, by this. This is es Eschaton? Eschaton? I don't fucking... I can speak. I know English. Um, this is one of my favorites, personally. Um, 
It has some cool lyrical nods to Thomas Hobbes, uh, Nietzsche, and uh, I forget who said it, but one of the songs, Between Shit and Piss We Are Born, has a cool uh, tie-in to a uh, real-life historical figure, um, which is always cool. That's one of the things that actually sticks out to me about this band. Their lyrics cover a lot of kind of like philosophy and theology and uh, all sorts of different cool kind of grim topics. Um, Time Wave Zero is a big standout on here, about the 2012 whole thing. Um, the Destroying Angel is uh, about uh, cool, like, poisonous mushroom. And uh, my personal favorite track is When the Lion Devours Both Dragon and Child. Now, Anonymous is another one of these hard bands, like Amorphous, to pin down in terms of um, genre, even though they have been generally more on the same page throughout their career than Amorphous has. I would say something like Melodic Industrial Black and Death. That should cover most of the bases when it comes to this. But their blend of extreme metal and melodic metal or melodic elements is really cool and kind of just hits the spot every time. This is in Darkenment. This is the most recent record they put out back in 2020, I believe. Um, haven't put out anything since then, unfortunately, but this was a good uh, cliffhanger to be left on. It's definitely one of their most accessible records in terms of production and just the delivery of choruses and whatnot. Very melodic, very anthemic, uh, grim as always, but very, very good nonetheless. Um, I like Endarkenment, thus always to Tyrants, has some pretty cool, almost like brutal death metal, like pig guttural vocals on there. Um, punish Them, Requiem has possibly what is a nod to Kierkegaard in the lyrics. I'm not sure on that though. This is the first album, speaking of lyrics, this is the first album that they've released lyrics for um, most of these songs. For the rest of it, um, they opted to stay a little bit secretive and with the lyrics on those albums, the only lyrics that you know from them are the lyrics that you can actually understand. A lot of what they do is very uh, purposefully incomprehensible, and I mean, you probably heard that whole uh, kind of joke or judgment about metal having just like incomprehensible screaming as lyrics. This is the sort of thing the band is like, oh, they heard that and took it personally, and we're like, okay, well, if you're gonna say that, then we're gonna actually make a band that does that. So yeah, that's kind of uh, what the lyrics or the vocal approach is for most of Anonymous discog. We have a uh, Domine known as Dignus from 2004 coming up next. This is, um, this has an interesting production or um, sound to it than the rest of their stuff. It's always harsh when you uh, come to this band's music, but <clears throat> they've kind of tidied it up in recent years. Domine known as Dignus specifically is not it's kind of middle of the road for me very good but there's other stuff that i like better um my favorite songs from here would be final destruction of dignity uh revaluation of all values uh this cannot be the end uh and oblivion gene this one might be my least favorite this is desideratum it's uh, Latin for what is uh, desired, basically. Um, there's only two tracks that really, really catch my attention. The rest is like, oh, this is good, but not something I would come back to um, very often. The ones that really do get me, though, are Idol and A Firm Foundation of Unyielding Despair, which is a cool little um, reference to, uh, what's his name? Bertrand Russell. He wrote a book, uh, Free Man's Worship that has, I believe, either an essay or a chapter where he talks about uh, metaphysics and stuff like that. And uh, uh, Firm Foundation of Unyielding Despair is, I believe, a direct kind of uh, partial quote from him. Cheerful guy. We got Codex Necro coming up next. This is their debut, full length. Uh, by far the most abrasive and just musically atrocious album that they've put out and one of the most musically atrocious albums I believe I've ever heard. Um, it's absolutely coded in distortion. Um, <clears throat> the noise 
um, and industrial, just raw industrial influences were the most prevalent here that they ever were in Anon Throck's work. My favorite tracks here are When Humanity is Cancer and Human All Too Fucking Human, which is again um, a Nietzsche reference. So yeah, this is uh, not the place to start out if you never heard the band, but it is just kind of a remarkable listen as an album and a piece of extreme music. Switching gears somewhat, we have this. This is another one of my favorite brutal death metal bands. This is Analepsy. This is their latest full length, Quiescence. I picked this up when I saw the band live a few months ago and God damn, was that a good show. Hearing Atrocities from Beyond, some of the cuts off that album live was fucking devastating. Uh, this represents a, somewhat of a departure from their old sound, not entirely. It's still brutal death. Uh, their last stuff was much the same, but a lot more slam oriented. This is more straightforward death metal. Uh, they changed singers and uh, their sound changed a little bit too. Um, not my favorite, definitely bottom of the pack when it comes to analepsy, but I mean, it's an analepsy album, so it's gonna be fucking good. Uh, Locus of Dawning, Stretched and Devoured, and uh, Quiescence are all really good tracks off this. Uh, one day I will get my hands on uh, Atrocities from Beyond and also the uh, EP Dehumanization by Supremacy, which are absolute gems of slam and brutal death so far as I'm concerned. Taking a near complete 180 now, we have, this is Ancient Bards. This is symphonic power metal from Italy, of all places. Uh, a female-fronted band, I think this is the first one, that we're gonna cover in this CD collection. Uh, she has a very, very nice voice that is perfectly uh, placed in this mix and this sound that the band has. She does get a little poppy on some of the high notes, a little nasally, which I don't really care for, but luckily she keeps those very much under control and to a minimum. So, I mean, this is definitely my favorite that Ancient Bards has put out in terms of a complete album. Um, every track here is pretty damn good. The one song that I would take off or just skip is Through My Veins. Uh, it's one of these tracks that's power metal, but it tries to incorporate harsh vocals, which very, very rarely works. Um, the, they just sound very amateur on this uh, track. But outside of that, <clears throat> incredible album. Um, very theatric. Ancient Death comes next. This is a local Massachusetts-based uh, death metal band. Very cool, somewhat cavernous. Uh, it's, I believe, their first uh, full length or their first uh, noteworthy non-demo release. This is a EP, actually, four tracks. All really good. Um, happy to have run by that at my local record store. Angel Corpse comes next. This is Exterminate. This is Black and Death Metal. Now, um, this is a really cool band and for the most part, pretty consistent as well. I have three records from them and in terms of sound, they're very much uh, Vatane and Marduk. Those are the bands that come to mind when I try to compare them to anybody. Uh, on this record particularly, I like Christ Hammer, War Torn, Into the Steel Storm or Storm of Steel. Uh, and That Which Lies Upon, Sons of Vengeance. This is a great record. I think uh, of the releases that I have from them, it's rivaled only by this. This is the inexorable. It's uh, another great release from Angel Corpse. Storm Gods Unbound, Wolf Lust, Reaver, As Predator to Prey. It's, uh, it's always a party. But the party stops when we get this one. This is of Lucifer and Lightning, 2007, I believe, and the last full length they ever put out. Now, usually bands have rough production, um, either by choice or by budget constraints on their early records, uh, but this is their last record that they put out, and it's also the worst in terms of production, which sucks because, I mean, the music here is really good under that production, but the way they produced this just was not the fucking move. Um, it sounds pretty damn bad. There's only one other Angel Corpse release I think I would like to get my hands on, that being Hammer of Gods. And that'll happen at some point, but not yet. 
Getting somewhat through the, you know, A section here, we have Arch Enemy. This is a band that I'm generally not a big fan of at all. But Wages of Sin, uh, back in the Angela era of the band, is very nice. Uh, particularly the song Burning Angel on here, the way she delivers the verses in particular, uh, and the kind of syncopation, just the sound of that overall song, and the production value of this particular album, I find to be a big exception to my um, no arch enemy rule. Arcona is the next in line here. We got Slobo, uh, another uh, female fronted, I would call them black and folk um, band from Russia. They sing all in Russian, so I'm not gonna, you know, um, embarrass myself by mispronouncing all these song titles, um, assuming I can even read them. But this album's very good. I only have two from Arcona, and uh, of the two, I like this one better. This is a... Uh... All right, what the hell? Let's just do it. Uh, uh, I think it's Goy, Rode Goy, something like that. Um, and this is the Arcona album to turn to if you haven't heard the band. This is them firing on all cylinders. Almost every song is perfect on this Um the way they incorporate traditional Russian um, instrumentation and songwriting approaches is phenomenal. And they can hold their own amongst all the, you know, Finnish big names for folk metal any day of the week, as far as I am concerned. After them, we have, or before them rather, these are, as I said, I've been recording this video, this is probably the fourth or whatever take. Um, Something always manages to go wrong, so some things are out of order. Arch Goat, we're going back in the alphabet a little bit. Um, this is a band that does one thing, but they do that one thing very well. They are um, black and death metal, or particularly bestial or war metal. Um, it's really anybody's guess at this point. I have my own opinions, uh, very, uh, very opinionated takes on subgenres and what have you, but I'll get into that autistic ranting in a different video down the line. For now, let's focus on Arch Goat. I have The Luciferian Crown, really good album. Or Bethlehem. And uh, as you can tell, Arch Goat really likes to branch out with their album art. Um, they really like using more than three colors. And, uh, you know, focusing art around a lot more than just goats. Uh, Satanism and uh, naked women and that's something I really appreciate from the band no but seriously their music is fucking sick um, and then this EP as well that's the arch goat collection for now uh, there's a few more that I hope to or at least one I know the um, apocalyptic triumphator I believe is the one that I have left to add to the collection but other than that I mean I believe that's all the arch code that is out there that I really want. In any case, let's move on. This record's pretty cool. It's one I misplaced, but we're gonna add it in at the end here anyway. It says, and oceans, right here. Cosmic world mother. I don't know if I'm, oh, I totally was holding that one upside down. So here we are. This is symphonic black metal played at a pretty inhuman pace. I'm not sure who the drummer is, but they knock it out of the park here. Uh, the real draw for me with this album is the fact that it features Breath from Fintroll. I really like his, the timbre of his vocals and his performance here is as stellar as it always is. Um, the melodies on this are fucking majestic. And I mean, it's just very spacey, honestly. Something about this, Reminds me of, um, like, it's not cosmic black metal by any means, but it's uh, drawing close. As this video draws on, I keep having phantom memories about owning more or different albums from bands that I have here. And case in point being this, this is Anthrax, my Anthrax collection. I only have four CDs here, but I could have sworn that I have um, the Armed and Dangerous EP. Unfortunately, I either don't or it's been uh, permanently misplaced, which I fucking hate. Um, we got Among the Living starting us out here. This is, uh, I mean, you guys know it. Uh, Anthrax doesn't 
They're a band people like to hate sometimes, uh, especially in thrash circles. They're definitely on the lighter side of thrash metal, but I really enjoy a lot of what they have to offer. Um, they're very much a kind of like feel good thrash band. Um, very inoffensive, but they, in terms of like playing thrash and being part of the big four, I feel like people don't give them a fair shake when you realize that they were playing faster in the 80s than pretty much any other thrash band. And that's not obviously to equate being fast to being good, but in terms of being groundbreaking in that particular day and age, uh, Anthrax had it down. Now, among the living starts us out, I've only got four, unfortunately, right now. Um, we've got State of Euphoria after that. This one has some filler on it, but um, it was actually, I believe, one of the first or second albums from Anthrax that I really found a liking for. Misery Loves Company, Be All End All, Out of Sight, Out of Mind, uh, Make Me Laugh, and Antisocial are the big ones here. This one's probably my favorite. This is uh, Spreading the Disease put out in 85 by uh, the folks over at Megaforce. Now, this one is a record that from start to finish, I pretty much enjoy the entire entirety of and is the quintessential Anthrax record. AIR starts it out, Lone Justice, Madhouse, Stand or Fall, The Enemy, Aftershock, uh, Aftershock, and then this last track, Gung Ho, stupid fast. Um, I don't really know what BPM, doesn't really matter, but those those double bass hits are incredible. Persistence of Time caps off the Anthrax collection. This is one that um, is a fine record, but compared to their 80s stuff, uh, falls a little bit short to my ears. This record is pretty cool. This is Arsis, it's a celebration of guilt. This is an interesting album. Uh, Genre-wise, this is uh, technical melodic death metal, I would say. It has a lot in common or a lot of um, resemblance to kind of mid-90s death. Uh, very technical, but also very catchy as well. Um, the record store that I frequent actually happened to be playing this by chance when I walked in one day and it really uh, piqued my interest. I was like, what the hell is this, man? This sounds really cool. And um, the guy at the record store kind of gave me the rundown on what these guys are about. I don't know if they're currently playing music, but this is a damn good record. Um, the Face of My Innocence start things out with a really memorable and punishing um, intro riff. And that sort of energy is carried throughout the entire uh, record. The lyrics can be a little eh, but um, luckily it's kind of extreme metal, so you can really look past that and enjoy the riffs, which should be uh, coming first and foremost. Now, most people can pinpoint a genre that they can consider like a transitionary genre in the sense that like, it helped open their eyes to a broader world of metal and subgenres and more extreme music generally. For me, that was power metal. For a lot of people that I've met and interacted with and talked about metal, um, the big ones are like new metal, glam, um, power metal, and then like 70s and 80s hard rock. For me, it was glam and then power. And this band that I'm about to show you is uh, of the power metal variety. Now, power metal is a genre that I still have a lot of love for in spite of its um, quirks, we shall say. Uh, it, it's a genre a lot of people love to hate on in uh, metal, especially as you go into the more extreme genres. And I honestly can see their points, uh, especially given the trajectory that this genre has taken in recent years. It's actually really fucking tragic. And uh, I mean, I'll go on that tirade at a different time. For now, let's stick to this uh, band, that being Avantasia. Now, Avantasia is kind of interesting. Um, it's one guy, basically, Tobias Semet, who was uh, of Ed Guy before he, you know, created this project. <laughs> and um, the shtick with Avantasia, it's, it's, it's got a very theatrical approach um, with a lot of the songs being uh, almost, I don't want to say musicals, but they incorporate, he writes all the music and then he brings on hired guns to help uh, execute his vision, so to speak. So for each album, you'll get a different lineup of uh, kind of big names in metal from 
mostly traditional and power metal genres. And it's a cool uh, concept. Not all the songs are great, not all the albums are great, but uh, younger me ate this shit up. And older me still has some appreciation for a few of these tracks. First record that I have to show off, this is a compilation, uh, Lost in Space Parts 1 and 2. So this is like cut tracks, uh, covers, that sort of thing. Uh, the first of Avantasia's stuff that I bought and that's kind of the theme with a lot of the compilations and just best ofs that I have in my collection. They're all relics of an older time. First full length that I have to show you is Ghost Lights. This is 2016. Not their most recent, but it's the most recent that I have from the group. Um, it has a good, you know, lineup of uh, heavy hitters. People from fucking uh, With Them Temptation, Michael Kiske from Halloween. D. Snyder, uh, Jordan Land, Ronnie Atkins, uh, people from Nightwish, freaking, you know, the whole crew, so to speak. Uh, good songs here, uh, highly recommend it. There's not much variance in this, uh, like, Aventasia Discog when it comes to, like, um, production. It's power metal. It's all gonna be, you know, uh, a little too clean for its own good most of the time. A Wicked Symphony, or The Wicked Symphony. It's not a Wicked Symphony, it's THE Wicked Symphony comes next. This is a cool record, um, not my favorite, but it does have some good good tracks. I like the title track, Wastelands, uh, is really memorable. I like Forever is a Long Time, and Runaway Train. Scarecrow is another one, cool album art. Not my favorite, again, in fact, uh, probably toward the bottom of the pack, actually. Um, it's uh, it's there, it's an album. Uh, and then here's where it all started. This is Metal Opera Parts 1 and 2. These are pretty cool. Uh, honestly, probably some of the better material from Avantasia. I prefer Part 1 far over Part 2, but they do still both have their uh, highlights. Farewell is a song that Michael Kiske is on, and every song that he's with or he's featured on for Avantasia is always the highlight of their respective albums. Something about his voice and the way he handles uh, melodies and just elevates the song, uh, regardless of what era or album it's on. Part two is a little more of a sleeper. It has some good stuff. I like The Final Sacrifice and Seven Angels. But outside of that, you know, Avantasia is not a band I find myself coming back to too often. That brings us to the end of the first segment of this series. I know I said it might be A, B, and C, or A and B, but honestly, it's going to be neither. So, womp, womp. We're going to cover this very strictly, uh, alphabetically going forward. This will be A, we'll cover B in the next segment. And, you know, thanks for watching. Um, until the next video, pop whatever you want to see down in the comments. Um, I always enjoy talking records with people. More Cascadian music will be coming out soon. I am really working on getting the drums up to speed. Literally just had some double bass issues um, that will be resolved soon. And actually, on a Cascadian note, uh, the band, or me, is going to be playing live next year. So tune into the Instagram page for details on that if you want. And I hope you liked what you saw in this video. See you on the next one.